So once again, I just wanted to welcome everyone to today's session, um, Living Reentry During COVID-19. These are definitely very unusual and very challenging times um, for all of us, and especially those of you who have really had to suddenly stop your service experience and maybe come home from overseas or um, back home from if you were staying within the United States. So um, we're glad for the opportunity to try to build some sense of community um, during these really difficult times. So we're thankful that you're here and we hope this is a good opportunity um, for all of you to kind of learn, you know, how to move forward during this unusual time. Um, my name is Katie Malembe. I'm joined by my colleague from Catholic Volunteer Network, Katie Delaney. We also have Kelly Nelson, who's our facilitator for today. Kelly is the director of From Mission to Mission, which is an organization that Catholic Volunteer Network uh, partners with quite a bit. Um, From Mission to Mission supports volunteers, missionaries, and their communities before, during, and after their service experiences. And Kelly's trained in trauma-informed care and peace circle facilitation. Um, she puts on retreats and workshops and presentations to accompany those who are in transition, like all of you. She also has firsthand mission experience herself, um, having spent two years in Peru with Incarnate Word missionaries. So. Um, she really has a lot to share, and we're very thankful that she's here with us. Um, so that's a little bit about us. I'm going to turn it over to Kelly in just a second, but we wanted to hear really briefly um, a little bit about you. So I'm going to launch um, a poll here, and we just want to know if you served internationally or domestically. Uh, we just kind of want to know where people are coming from. So you'll see that poll up on your screen. Just take a quick few seconds to respond um, and we will share the results can you so you can see where you know the rest of the audience is also coming from all right I'll give it five more seconds okay. sharing the results there um, so it looks like about 80 percent have just recently served overseas and 20% um, have served domestically. Thank you for your um, input on that. I think we'll be able to speak to both experiences um, during this session. So we're glad that you are all here. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kelly. Awesome. Can you all see my screen okay here? Let's see. There we, we go. go. Awesome. Well, good afternoon um, and thank you for the kind introduction, Katie. And just wanna say thank you all for being present here as we spend some time together considering how we might navigate this time of re-entry during this time, during this unique time, I should say, um, very unique time of a global pandemic. So not only is the re-entry experience from a mission or, or volunteer experience unique in itself i feel like you have this extra unique experience with what's going on in the u.s today um, and around the world i want to say that um, i feel for all of you um, know that you're resilient that re-entry is hard in and of itself and that this current situation adds a whole new element of challenge, of grief, and of mystery to it. I know after, from speaking with CVM and some of your program directors that some of you have returned by choice, others not. Some have ended assignments early, knowing that maybe their time and service is, is over. Programs, some programs have shut down for the year, and others are waiting to find out whether or not they'll be able to return um, and if so, when? All of these are very real. All of these are difficult to navigate. And all of us are working together through a, a great time of uncertainty. So if you're struggling right now, I want to reassure you that you are normal. And I hope that some of what we'll discuss today will be helpful as you move through this time, whatever the outcome is for you. We are going to focus today on what this unique reentry experience is like. Let's see here. 
Here we go. We're going to talk about some of the challenges of, of endings of this time in waiting and unknowing. We'll talk a little bit about understanding transition and managing transitions. And I'll share some strategies for coping during this time. Things have been tried and true for missioners we've worked with before. Um, things that they would recommend to you. Some who have ended in, under normal circumstances and many who have ended um, during times of great conflict, during times of illness, or having had, had to come home due to a death in the family or for their own health reasons. Um, so lots of wisdom to be shared. And I, um, I have the privilege of sharing this information. This is not stuff I've made up. It's, it's really from, it's, it's really gathered from 40 years of working with volunteers and missionaries. So it's all of their collective wisdom that I get to share with you. Before, um, oh, I do wanna to mention too, that I, I'll have questions for you for your own personal reflection throughout the webinar and have also shared some additional resources with CVN to include in with, with the recording and the follow-up email. Uh, I would encourage you if you're, if you're open to it to pull out a journal or a notebook, feel free to take notes as we go along to some of those questions or you can always revisit them later too. Totally up to you. But before we delve into some more content, I wanted to share a short reflection with you. It's, it's one I found nice and comforting to review during this time. Um, I think too, before delving into a webinar of, of, this, of this nature, and if I'm recalling my experience coming home, I always found it nice to just pause and take a breath, make space for reflection. And so I wanted to model that um, in this webinar. You may have seen this circulating online, it's a poem called And the People Stayed Home by Kitty O'Meara. And I thought, I'll read it out loud in just a moment, but let's take a moment to quiet ourselves, quiet yourself in whatever space you're in, whatever physical space, psychological space, emotional space you're in. And I'll read it for us. And the people stayed home. And the people stayed home and read books and listened and rested and exercised and made art and played games and learned new ways of being and were still and listened more deeply. Some meditated, some prayed, some danced, some met their shadows and the people began to think differently and the people healed. And in the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, mindless, and heartless ways, the earth began to heal. And when the danger passed and people joined together again, they grieved their losses and made new choices and dreamed new images and created new ways to live and heal the earth fully as they have been healed. I don't know about you, but I've appreciated finding things like this to pause and remember that while so much has stopped and has been put on hold and feels sort of out of, out of the norm and is unreachable right now, there is still a lot of life and goodness and healing and newness to come, and newness in the day to day. Secondly, I wanted to share this next slide with you. Um, this seems, I know that seems really silly. This is a very famous children's book that you all may know by Eric Carlyle, The Very Hungry Caterpillar. Um, but I found much light, much to, in much delight in reading this with my, my toddler these days. Um, there's a part in the book near the end where the caterpillar builds himself a cocoon. And in, on the page, it says, he stays there for more than two weeks. And after this time, he breaks through the cocoon 
as a beautiful butterfly. And I found it odd because I hadn't really thought that much about this book in the past, but upon reading it a couple of weeks ago with my daughter, um, this is when our state of Minnesota first started recommending social distancing and closing public spaces. Um, it just touched me in a whole different way. And I'm sure for some of you this, this is happening as well, but lots of things um, that I didn't pay as much attention to before are really, they're moving me in different ways. And so I found a lot of light um, and delight in this, as I said, and I just thought perhaps you might too, especially with it being a children's book. And there's lots of joy in that. I want to start by naming things related to the reentry experience that might resonate with you. Um, I know feelings, we're all about feelings <laughs> these days, um, but I think the more we're able to name how we're feeling, what we're experiencing, what is going on, um, is not only helpful in figuring out where you're at and what you need to do, um, it's essential in, in working through it. Um, I included some silly pictures to hopefully brighten your day, or at least maybe even inspire some vocab for some of the emotions you might be feeling. Um, but I'm gonna have you take a few moments to consider, consider to yourself, um, and this might be a time for the notebook or journal, um, how are you feeling today? Maybe at this moment, what feelings have surfaced since you've returned home? Probably many. And what feelings surface when you think about your experience? And that could be any piece of your experience. There is no need to share these out loud. These are for you. Um, mostly wanting you to consider them as we move forward through the content. So living reentry now. I would say in our work with volunteers and missioners over the last 40 years, we've heard a variety of a variety of things in terms of feelings that come up in general um, regarding reentry. These are things you all may also be feeling among the many other layers of feelings. Um, the most common, I would say we hear, are feelings of grief and loss. Many express a sense of, of longing for what was Many missionaries and volunteers find that they thrive at their service sites um, in whatever they're doing, um, truly come, come to life in those experiences and have a really hard time leaving them. Many feel that the work was left incomplete when their time of service is done, um, really at any point, whether they had to leave early or, um, or end on, on normal terms. Some feel that they didn't do enough. And some feel guilt and frustration um, with their privilege. Some feel guilt and frustration about their home country, what they've returned to. Some maybe about, about their program or any decisions that may have been made uh, on their behalf. And then others, um, frustration, sadness, all of the things related to societal practices in their home country. So as I mentioned before too, we've we've worked with those who've returned abruptly due to increased violence in their country of service, whether that was violence to their community there, violence to their volunteer community or to an individual directly. Um, we've worked with folks who have experienced death or illness in their in their families or with close friends, programs closing for a, a variety of reasons. Um, and often much unexpected to, to volunteers um, and situations where volunteers and missionaries really had no, no say in, in the choice being made. 
and in these types of situations, we hear things that surface like, I feel deeply hurt. Many express deep, deep pain and sadness due to the lack of opportunity to say goodbye or know what the situation um, may be like for locals upon their departure. Um, and how are things being communicated with them? Some express a sense of unfairness or injustice and, and even betrayal. Um, and so, you know, these are all factors that play into the transition of returning home. And these ones in particular, like the situation many of you are in right now, all of you probably, um, they add additional layers to work through uh, complicating the process and the new reality that you're experiencing. Some of the other factors that influence reentry to consider beyond situations of, of loss um, and violence and perhaps your reason for leaving um, are the length of time that you were in country. Um, I know many of you were serving internationally. Most international programs are, are longer. So for some of you, you know, maybe you were in country or at your domestic site for a part of a year. For others, perhaps you were there for a number of years and that can influence um, what it's like to leave, right? The relationships you're leaving behind, um, the role in your, in your work, how connected you feel with the culture, things like that, that all plays into, all plays into the bundle of, of things you're feeling and processing through right now. Um, a huge one right now is are the ongoings in your home country. So right now we're experiencing, um, you know, this is around the world. We're experiencing the coronavirus, but you know, you've been asked to come home during a time that you're also being asked to to quarantine and isolate um, amidst this global pandemic. Um, when I think about my time returning from from Peru, I had you know, a pretty seamless volunteer experience. It was positive all, all around. Um, I loved it and I still struggled when I came home. Um, and I had friends and family inviting me out to eat, wanting to hear about my experience. And we were not worrying about a quickly spreading virus. Um, so I can only imagine what it's like during this time for all of you. I just want, I want to name that. I want to recognize that um, many of us, myself, your program leaders, CVN, we all, we see that this is a unique situation for all of you. Um, and we're just, we hold you right now. We're holding you right now thinking of you. Um, some other factors are changes in you. You've definitely been changed by your experience in whatever way that is. Um, however long you were there or wherever you were, so coming home, um, you are in a way a different you. That can affect your processing. Family, friends, and community, um, these folks back home, they've changed too. They've been living their lives. They have their own understanding of your unique experience. And they're also living a whole new reality now in the US, just like you related to the coronavirus. We're gonna talk a little bit about coping strategies later on, but some things to consider in this new reality back home. Um, and again, if you wanna jot notes down, feel free, but some things that I think would be a good thread to, to think about in these coming days are, one, how can you make meaning and find purpose here and now in the situation? And it's okay if you're not ready to answer that, um, but considering it might help you move through a little bit. And the second question is, how can you care for yourself in this new context? What are the things that were free before that you can rely on? What are some new things that you can adapt to? Some shared wisdom from our community of returned missionaries and volunteers would share. Um, that your feelings, whatever they are, are real and valid. That your 
struggling, any struggling is normal. Stress, grief, and anxiety are very common and very normal feelings to endure during times like these. Naming it, doing what you can to name what's going on is essential. Naming how you feel and where you are in the process of reentry, um, it, it really, it really helps just to call it out. And you know, we can share some resources to help put names to things. Because so sometimes I think when you're going through it, it's hard to even pinpoint uh, what the specifics are. And then talking about it, talk to someone, talk to anyone who you can confide in, and um, get creative with our, you know. Um, the virtual modes that we have of connecting with folks these days. So to help you through this process a little bit more, I want to talk about understanding and managing transition a little bit. Uh, this image here, and I'll use my mouse to kind of point things out, hopefully you can see that. Um, this image is a combination of a couple of different change curves or curves of transition. Um, the phases of transition, but the ending, neutral zone, and new beginning, which you can see in the green writing here, these are by William Bridges. We use his work often in the work that we do. Um, but I've combined it with the Kubler-Ross change curve. This is the, the curve you see here, the arrow, um, with the word shock, denial, frustration, depression, experiment, decision, and integration. Um, I find that um, for me, it's a more comprehensive understanding when I see them together at the same time, they function similarly, and I thought it might be helpful to kind of give you a double dose, depending on how you how you relate to, to words and these types of phases or curves best. Um, so I've overlapped them for us as we as we think through this. I first uh, want to know that change and transition are not the same thing. Change is very situational and transition is a psychological process through which we come to terms with any given change. Transition is the time we let go of the way things used to be and we're asked to reorient ourselves to the way things are now. I think we can also illustrate this with the example of a geographical move, which many of you have, have done. Um, the change is the relocation itself involving the packing up and the trip you took, whether in a, in a car or a plane. Um, and the transition to all of that involves the confusion, the distress, and any excitement you might feel as you go through that. Changes are always unique to the situations, but transitions are, are usually quite similar in, in, in pattern in how, um, in how we work through them. And so while it may not feel like it, I wanna remind you that in many ways, you are experts in transitions and you are very well equipped with the skills you need to move through this challenging time. Um, We've all, I mean, I guess no matter, no matter your age, have worked through many, many transitions, many big transitions. Um, they've certainly been inspired by unique changes, but um, the general flow of the process can be similar. And I would encourage you to recall some of the things that were helpful to you in previous transitions, maybe even transitioning to your service site. You know, what things did you rely on to take care of yourself what helped you get through some of the, maybe some of the low points there and um, what inspired some of the high points. Um, another good reminder is to, to be patient with yourself because we all move through these, um, these transition processes at our own pace. Because we're all unique individuals, we, we really, respond to transition differently, depending on how transitions of the past have, have treated you, how you've worked through the process before, that's going to influence how, how you navigate the process now.
I want to talk a little bit about the three phases by William Bridges, and I'll talk through a little bit of how the change curve aligns with those. So transition is made up of three phases, according to Bridges. Um, he refers to the ending, the neutral zone, and the new beginnings. With transition, the ending comes first. So there's a change that sort of spurs this transition that is to come that asks you to sort of give up an old life, an old identity, old way of being, and, and move into to this new one that's coming. Each phase is its own unique thing. It's filled with its own positives and painful feelings and emotions. The, the ending over here, this is, this is what happened or the change that took place, again, to initiate the transition. It aligns with the change or grief curve as it pertains to shock and denial. And if you have, I have some follow-up notes that will have this in it, but if you wanna jot things down, feel free. Um, but some opportunities to consider during this phase, so during the ending phase, um, are really to focus on self-awareness, seeking some closure as much as you're able to, redirecting your energy, and considering what good can come from this ending. Um, I know sometimes that, feels far away, but um, again, it's an opportunity for exploration during this particular phase. As we move into the neutral zone, this is the time when your formal reality and your former identity are, are gone. You moved somewhat past the ending, but the new identity and your new reality has not really taken hold. It hasn't taken root. Um, it's an in-between phase. And people usually hang out in the neutral, the neutral zone for, for quite a bit of time, um, but it can be a really rich time, a rich phase. It's often known for being filled with lots of growth and creativity. And as this phase, it aligns with our frustration, um, some depression and experimenting, it can provide some opportunities like being objective, deciding what's next in the short term, I would recommend um, taking control of what you can, looking for innovation, um, really it, taking time to experiment with new ideas, play around with things, get creative. I can imagine many of you have probably started doing that depending how long you've been there. As we get into new beginnings, this is, it's not really the start of something new necessarily. Um, it's not necessarily another change, um, but it's really when you start to buy into the, or get on board with or feel at home with the new. Um, so when you start to settle in, um, things feel less uncertain, things feel less less strange. Um, again, you're feeling more at home with the new. This, this phase of new beginnings, it aligns with, um, aligns with our acceptance, decisions we've made about moving forward, and how we're integrating the experience we've had into a new season of life. Some opportunities I would, rec I would share during this phase are um, really to take action on your decisions. There's an opportunity to implement new ideas, apply what you've learned, um, and really the opportunity to look forward to possibilities and, and what's next. I would say that for most during this time, new beginnings um, are beyond many of us. Um, you're likely sitting with the ending still, or perhaps moving back and forth in the neutral zone. Um, that's usually pretty a pretty fluid space where you might see your, find yourself experimenting with some new ideas, um, bouncing back to depression or frustration, and then bouncing back to experimenting with the new ideas. There's lots of that back and forth during that phase. 
Um, and I would say that that's just fine and absolutely normal. And, you know, the amount of time you're in that space is different for everyone. For, for you all, because many of you have just, just ended or are just um, in the ending phase, you've just come home. Um, others, I don't know, maybe you've been home a couple of weeks, but some have even just been home a number of days, I'm sure. Um, I wanna focus right now on the idea of endings and this time of waiting and not knowing. Um, and, and let's just, just name that, endings, endings are hard um, and you're experiencing multiple endings at once. Um, how things have ended is also affecting how you're moving through this transition process. Perhaps it's keeping you in, in that ending phase longer or in the frustration or depression phase a little longer. Um, that's all, again, it's, it's, it's fine, it's real. Um, I think in your reflection, I would ask you if you can really sit with and try to name what has ended for you. What, what are those specific endings, if there are multiple? And then if you can also consider and name what has not ended. What are those things that are still going for you? And taking the time to do both, I think especially naming what has not ended will assist you as you move forward through the process. It'll help you sort of have, have an anchor as you go along. Some other things to consider in your reflection around this time of ending. And these are questions I'm including for you all to, to spend time with, however you will or want to. Um, think about, you know, did you have a choice in your leaving or regarding this ending? If yes or no, what, what choices do you have right now? Again, really trying to claim that control, like what is in your choosing now? Um, so maybe this ending wasn't your choice, but are there things you can hold on to now? If you didn't have time to end well, how can you rewrite your ending or can you rewrite your ending somehow? Can you say goodbye in a different way? How can you stay connected if, if that's what you'd like or need? And if you're waiting to find out if you're, if you're going back or not and when, um, what can you do now? I think it's important to try to remember that you're really not alone in this. Um, right now, it, we're, we're all together living in great uncertainty. And so what can we all do with this, with this energy to remain healthy and strong in the moment? So that we can, so we can best serve now in our current situation and in whatever capacity we're going to be called to serve next. Um, just want to remind you too that moving through transition is not linear. So, you know, while this change curve um, has this nice little dip and upward spring. And these phases are, um, they look sequential. Um, they are certainly not. Um, you will find yourself likely moving back and forth. And so I would challenge you, my challenge, because it is back and forth, is find, find a regular time. I don't know if it's, it could be weekly, it could be bi-weekly, whatever it is for you, but challenge you to work to name where you are in the process now, where and what bucket are you and what stage are you in and what are the opportunities there? In the handout I've sent to CVN, there's a list of those different opportunities if you want those as reminders later. But really would challenge you to figure out where in the process you are now and then in your reflection, consider what you need to do to move forward. Um, that way you're taking, um, whether they're baby steps or big steps, whatever it is, you're taking some sort of action to, to help yourself move, it, move through it. And with that, I wanted to share some strategies for coping.
for moving through this process. Um, the first one I have here is that um, we recommend finding a regular time and place to be alone. This may be no problem right now for some of you, but I can imagine it being more challenging for others depending on your living situation. Uh, make sure it's a space for you. Perhaps create one if you're able to that inspires you, whether it's a chair or a corner, a special room. Maybe you can get outside, really whatever works for you, but just encourage you to find a regular place to be that's yours. Be faithful to prayer or meditation. Again, it's what works for you and you know you best. What are those things that fill you up? Seek out someone to walk with you in your emotional and spiritual journey. Maybe that's a community member, maybe a spiritual director, a friend, or a mentor. Consult a counselor to help sort out your experience. This is totally acceptable and normal. We've had many, many volunteers and missionaries we've worked with um, seek professional help and um, they recommended it to others. Um, so again, you know you best, but certainly I would, you know, if you need it, seek it out. And there's lots right now doing um, televisits and virtual visits. So um, if that's something you need, uh, we can certainly match you with, with resources. Keep a journal or sketchbook. Explore more fully your own needs and desires. This is taking advantage of the, the opportunity in this ending phase to, um, to seek some self-awareness. Take care of yourself, your mind, body, and spirit. Consider your whole self. Spend time with friends who will listen. Create virtual spaces for this right now and don't be afraid to make them fun. Um, I think many of us have a support system that is made up of different people who serve, who serve different purposes in many ways. You know, some you might go to for, for a good laugh and a great going out social time. Others you might seek for, um, for really sitting with those hard, hard thoughts, deeper thoughts. And so finding the right people to fill um, the support you need is really important too. So maybe in your journaling, you can make a list of all of your support people and consider what you might go to them for um, and checking in with them too, seeing how they're doing, I think is really nice. They too are, are likely struggling for Maybe for different reasons, maybe similar ones, who knows. Begin networking to form or expand your support system. And make choices in view of short-term goals. Really, because we're kind of living in the moment right now, it's hard to know what's coming even, even in a week. Um, you know, our governors are making decisions every two weeks, it seems. Um, but what are some short-term goals you can focus on and what choices can you make in, the, in that time? Um, so these are, these are only some suggestions. Um, there's certainly more resources out there, um, but these are ones, these are tried and true. Um, and we recommend these often and use them ourselves. And we hope that you are finding and continue to find what works for you during this time. Um, we're gonna take some questions here in a moment, but I did wanna mention that you can find some helpful articles. If, you, if you're thirsty or hungry for more information about transition and about managing through stress and anxiety and grief, um, there are helpful articles on our website. We have a resource library there. And then also some practices, so spiritual practices, um, physical ones um, that are helpful. And then also my, my contact information will be included, included in the follow-up information. And, you know, we are happy to support in any way that we can. Feel free to email our staff. You can call us up too for any one-on-one -on -one 
consulting you might want. And thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so much good stuff there. I was nodding my head the whole time and there were a lot of um, affirmative comments coming through. So I know that this was very helpful for a lot of people here. Um, I'm gonna give you just a little break <laughs> for one second because I, I kind of wanted to pull the group again um, and if and find out how many people are um, in like self isolation because of travel right now, like that 14 day recommendation that they really like you really stay alone. So if that's you, I'm just curious. Um, there's a little hand on your toolbar. You can raise it. Um, and I think it would be helpful just for us to know how many people are really in, in self solo isolation at the moment. So just take a second. I'll, I'll kind of report back to the group. Wow. Oh, okay. I would say it looks like um, between between a third and a half of the group have their hands raised, and that we have 62 people on right now. So that's um, if that helps you to feel if, if you're one of those who really feels alone to know that there's you know probably about 30 other people right in this group with you right now um, who are experiencing that. I hope that brings some comfort and also just wanted to thank you for the hard work that you're doing right now of being alone and um you know as much as it seems doesn't seem like it that is service to your community and to your loved ones and everything so thank you for that um just thought that was helpful to understand yeah. um so please do type in your questions um in the chat bar, um, we'll be able to take them. And while that's happening, Kelly, I was thinking about one that I wanted to ask. Um, yeah. The the Bridges um, Kubler Ross model um, got me thinking about time, and like time is so weird right now. Anyway, even um, for those of us who aren't just coming back uh, from service and like I was thinking about a conversation I had on Tuesday and it really honestly felt like a month ago that I had that conversation. But when you look at a chart like that, it can be easy to think like, okay, day one, I should feel shock and day two, I should feel de denial and day three, you know, then frustration. Like, can you just talk a little bit about the experience of time through that? And like, is there too much time to spend in one stage or, you know, sh should you expect it to move um, I know you said it's not linear, but like, what recommendation would you have if somebody feels like one phase is taking too long? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think in a, in a time like this, where our sense of time has changed so drastically um, and things are changing so quickly, I, I really don't think there's, there's a fixed one, um, a fixed amount of time. Um, I would say usually under certain even even under normal um, circumstances for reentry, um, you know, it can take people months to to work through the transition process. Some people even years. Um, and again, that depends on the experience. It depends on the person. But I would say, in a time like this, like it's it's okay to visit um, graphs like that regularly and kind of like assess where you are, even on a day to day basis. I think especially right now during this time of um of crisis really i mean it's um you've just come home and you're experiencing everything that re-entry entails but you're also having to deal with with rent you know or things going on with your family and just like the reality of adjusting to isolation and things like that that i um i just think it's too hard it's too hard to put a finite time on that um one example that I have, I um, I meet monthly with a, it, it's a women's leadership group where kind of a peer support group for people who run organizations and businesses. And um, we did this same sort of exercise where we we talked through the transition, um, and we we all shared where we thought we were, but so many people were like, 
Well, I, I'm here today, but I think yesterday I was here and a couple of days ago, I was like, I was experimenting with new ideas, which felt really hopeful, but today I'm back and frustrated. So I think, especially during a time like this, it's really, it's really fluid. Um, it's too hard to get at this point long-term, I think. I hope that's helpful. Sorry, Katie, mm -hmm. it was long. <laughs> mm -mm. Well, that, I think that's helpful. I hope it's helpful for all of you too. Um, Great. Okay. There's lots of questions here, actually. <laughs> I'll just kind of start um, and read through them. We, we do have a little bit of time. So um, let me see. Sorry, I'm adjusting my um, screen so I can read the whole question. This is a comment, but I'll share it because I think it's helpful. Someone recently made the comment that the quarantine has actually been a blessing and that there is less cultural shock and outside pressure and influence. I found this to be a very positive way to think about quarantine. It's nice to share. Thank you. Yeah, this is really nice. Okay. Um, hi, Kelly. Do you think it's at all possible to move forward in the transition stages if you're wanting to hear when or if you'll go back to your country of service? I had to leave so quickly and have been given no timeline by my program that I'm struggling to be able to name where I'm at emotion-wise because I have no idea when I'll be back. That's a really good question. I think, um, I, and I think that might have to live in the kind of unknown category for a while um but what i would recommend doing is um so it sounds like you left abruptly um and that it maybe was not your choice but um i think trying to to break it down and slow it down into to things that are in your control um and so whether or not you know the hope is that that you can go back we don't know when um I don't think your program knows when, and I don't know that it's, it's realistic for them to know at this point. Um, but what I would do is focus on the things that, that can kind of help make um, how you left, or that makes sense. So, you know, thinking about, um, I would assume you're very much in that, that ending phase. So I would really focus on um, finding closure, um, even though like there's this hope that, that you'll go back, um, it'll still be different when you go back. Um, and so think about, you know, are there specific people you would want to, um, say goodbye to or thank or, um, any, any loose ends you can think of, um, that would kind of help bring closure to that and move forward. Even if it's something like things you want to voice to your program, I think, I think it would be really healthy and just fine to, to express some of those things and, um, in a respectful way and just just kind of let them know like where you are um you know i think many programs again they're also in this um situation of unknown and uncertainty um waiting on outside things to let them know when it's okay to send people back and so um as much as you can do to to kind of take take the reins on um, current choices um i would do that um, I hope that's helpful. I know it's not a perfect answer, but um, I think finding that if you if you do choose to see that ending as a true ending and find closure, that you will be able to move forward even during this time of uncertainty. So even knowing not knowing when and if you'll go back, you'll still be able to progress a little bit. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kelly. I think this next one, it's kind of a comment too, and it's related. Um, hmm. It says, I think, well, let me read it. What are the chances of going back when we know that it will take a long time to be over COVID-19? I wonder if it's better to move on instead of waiting to hear if the organization that sent us will survive financially. Um, it's a, a tough one <laughs> to yeah. respond to. Um, I think it's a good, it is a good question though. Um, and I think that's one that everyone, you know, kind of needs to answer for themselves. Um, but what I would do, I don't think, I don't think there's a need to make a decision right now because there is so much to work through that I would say, take it in strides. Um, so take those steps 
um, I would say take advantage of the, the opportunities of the different phases to really um, sit with different ideas. It is, a, it is a new time. Like people, you know, maybe it's okay if you, if you, if you want to go back, but maybe this whole experience um, it calls you to do something else or maybe who knows right um, mm -hmm. and so I would just recommend taking small steps mm -hmm. yeah and I might be able to add to that because I've been in many many conversations in the past few weeks with um, the staff of many different volunteer programs and mission programs um, so I have been super impressed by the seriousness that the staff is taking um, this and the concern that they have for their volunteers and missioners. So I'm not sure which program you're from. I, I don't think it matters because I, I really do feel like um, you should have, you should feel like, like there's um, their work, the program staff is working with your interest, you know, so don't feel betrayed by um, the time that's spent, you know, trying to figure this out. But also to add to that, um, I think that there is a sense of community within CBN programs. So if I hope, I hope programs do, do not have to close because of this situation, it's impossible to predict, but, um, you know, stay in touch with your program. There may be a chance to transfer you to a different program or something like that. Um, you know, just be honest with your, program director about where you're at in your personal journey. And um, they, I'm sure, will also um, keep you up to date with what's happening because they want the best for you as well. Um, just wanted Absolutely. to add that. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on to the next question. We still have a lot, so we'll see what we can get through. If anybody has to drop off, that's okay. We will record this. You can always come back to it. But the next one is, my family and friends are continuously saying, I'm so happy you're home. And although I understand they were worried and are super thankful to have, and I'm super thankful to have their support, hearing that comment bothers me because I'm currently not happy to be home. How can I help my family and friends understand without hurting their feelings? That's a great question. I And I think that that's one we hear a lot, even under regular reentry circumstances. Um, and I think as much as possible, you can invite your family into your experience, um, the better. Um, and I don't think, um, they're certainly not saying those things, um, with that intention. I think it's, um, they, they probably sincerely are very happy you're home and aren't even aware of, of how that makes you feel. Um, but I think as much as you can invite them into your own internal dialogue, I think that will be helpful. Um, and sometimes you have to, you might have to initiate that. Um, yeah, I hope that's helpful. But I often recommend to volunteers and missioners that remind them that um, people back home, they don't really, they don't know the full extent of your experience. and. They, be, they might not even know that you're missing it. They probably think you're just as excited to be home. And maybe because, you know, some aren't familiar at all with what it's like to have an experience like this um, and to want to serve domestically or internationally. And so they don't know how, um, how close to your heart it is. And um, just because it's different, it's, it's not their own experience. And so as much as you can exchange some dialogue with them, um, I think, I think they will come to understand. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. But that is hard. I do want <laughs> to say that that's hard. It is hard to, to balance both of those experiences and feelings. Mm -hmm. All right. The next question, um, is language that focuses on moving on seems to reject the fullness of what a post-grad experience was. I just finished my service of two and a half years, so in many ways I left my life and my home. How can we integrate the experience? Maybe it depends on the program type though. Yeah, definitely people are in different 
stages based on how long they were there and and everything yeah. but there's um integration i'm sure you can speak to that Kate, kelly is like it's going to be a part of everybody's experience regardless of how long they were there absolutely um i like to use the word like moving through and moving forward versus moving on or letting go because i don't think um you know an experience such as this like this is one that's totally transformed your life and it's made you a different person and it excites you in different ways about things. And so I think as much as possible, you can integrate values and lessons learned into life here. Um, I think you'll find out, you know, you'll find great joy in that. And so there are, there are lots of ways to, to integrate. I think um, starting with reflecting on and considering what are those things you want to integrate? What do you appreciate? What are the gems? Um, yeah, what are those things you want to hold on to from your experience and whether they're very like specific things um, or general ideas or values and then sifting through and thinking through how can I in our context in this context that I'm now in live these out you know if it's for example the value of simplicity you want to commit to living simply um, what are the specific ways you're going to do that and we think about the why behind it. Um, you know, if that let's say, you know, if that was the value you're taking from your experience and integrating, there's a whole slew of them that you know you could you could take with you. But that's where I would start. I would start by really um, thinking through the experience, even like working to we in our workshops we we tell the story of our experience. So I think as much as possible, you can share your story with people who want to and can listen um, and then pick the highlights um, sift through those things that surface those things that you want to carry on um, name those and and carry them with you in this context um, we have a lot more on integration i can add i'll add some resources to our website on that if that's helpful if more folks want that but in whatever stage you're in however long you were there you certainly have been transformed and will be transformed by this experience. And so I think whatever reflection you can take forward and move along with, I think will be beneficial to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I keep thinking about like how much our culture in the United States will be changed by this experience. And I feel like those who've done like had that intensive service, experience are um, going to really have something to offer to people around solidarity and community and simple living just like a, a different perspective that i think people are potentially tasting for the first time not by a choice um so i'm just really curious to see what will change but i i think that um for the asker of this question um there may be even more ways to integrate your service experience into whatever comes next um, because mm -hmm. life will be very different when we come out of this experience yeah I, I think so too it was i was actually on a call this morning with a bunch of um people from missions offices and mission programs and um was just it had me reflecting on how i feel like in a lot of ways this is asking and like calling all people of society to live mission in a way or live service mm -hmm. in a way to one another and i think it's um it's they are unfortunate circumstances but i do think there's going to be a huge shift because of it and you know really asking people to look at things differently and do things mm -hmm. for others differently mm -hmm. Yeah, this is Katie oh, too. Mm -hmm. I was just going to add, um, I think it helped me helps me continually to think about integration as a um, continual process too. And um, I kind of had to shift away from integration being something that I could achieve or that like one day I would be integrated <laughs> or that um, I would get there. Uh, but it's actually been really life giving to see how like new aspects of your experience and with passing years and passing time open up and even that different aspects of of 
service um, come to life in new ways and there are opportunities to to revisit so thinking about that a little more long term um, took off some of the pressure at least and invited me to to see ways I could integrate right now in this particular context um, without having to find a way for each and every piece that I really loved and appreciated. Hmm. Absolutely. I feel like mm -hmm. it's one of those like gifts that keeps unwrapping over the years. You know, like um, I keep thinking about how I've, I've changed throughout different seasons of my life and how um, while I was in mission for two years, I served as a volunteer for two years, 10 years ago, um, I have found that I see it differently um, and in new light with each season of life. Like, you know, for example, when I, when I became a mom a couple of years ago, like that, it had me thinking about whole new aspects of my time in mission that I didn't consider before just because of the stage of life I was in while experiencing it. Um, but I, yeah, I love that, that sharing, Katie, that it really is sort of a gift that, that keeps on giving and something you'll want to continuously integrate in new ways. I have, I think we have just one comment and one question left in case anybody's wondering when this will end. Um, so we will, we will wrap up soon. Um, I think the comment is helpful to share in light of what we just talked about, um, integration. Um, but this was related to the one about um, the person who was waiting to go back. Um, and the person says, I think that the question, there is no going back. If one is able to return to mission, it's very likely that the reality on the ground will be very different as well as changes that one has experienced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like, it's not saying you can't go back, um, but the expectation of picking up where you left off um, is probably unrealistic that you'll be changed and the people who you were serving and living with will be changed too. So I think that's a good point um, to remember about mm -hmm. this. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, and I think this is the, the last question, then we'll wrap up. Um, I'm struggling to support community mates when I feel as though we are in different parts of the emotional transition process. How do you recommend holding community mates during, during this with those differences? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm assuming then you're maybe all living together and continue to meet um, in some ways. Um, but I would encourage sort of a, a community conversation. I don't know if you're still doing community nights, but I would encourage a conversation around this and um, asking people to maybe name where they're at and just just sharing it. And, and also, if, you know, if you are living intentional community, can you um, can you regularly check in on like what do I need? Um, what do I need right now? <laughs> what do I need for myself? And what, what do I need from my community right now? Um, again, that's me thinking like you're still living in community, thinking maybe you're still living, um, you know, with some of the, the pillars of having community nights and stuff like that. But if not, you know, is there a way you can ask people where you're at or to consider the transition process and, um, and reassure yourself and them that it is okay to be at, at, at different places? But I do think um, in any community or family living situation, it is important to to name things out loud. Um, I know I've said that a lot throughout the, the webinar, but naming things, it, it puts it out there. People can, you can better support yourself and people can better support you when, when they're aware of what's going on. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, yeah. I think like this whole experience, even though for even for those of us who have been home for a while, just being experiencing coronavirus, like we really have to be forgiving of each other um, in this time and forgiving of ourselves. Like probably nobody's at their best or moving forward in the way that they hoped or planned in life. Like it's just hard for everybody. So if you find that yourself or a community member is just not where you think they should be, um, just try to be a little extra forgiving because it's a unique, unusual time. 
and mm -hmm. um, it's always helpful to just assume everybody's doing the best they can i think so um absolutely trying to remind myself of that too <laughs> so <laughs> yeah Great. Well, I'm I'm really grateful to all of you who stayed on for this extra time of conversation. Um, and Kelly, thank you so much for yeah. presenting um, all of this important content for us. Um, it's such an ongoing journey, and I I really do feel for all of you who are experiencing this, you know, so suddenly and in such a unique way. Um, but mm -hmm. I hope you found little glimmers of hope um, and you know, comfort in knowing that your experience is one of many and one that missionaries over time have gone through and, um, you know, you'll get through it. <laughs> so thank you, Kelly, for providing that um, that guidance. And yep. um, we are going, going to share in a follow-up email, Kelly's, um, the website for From Mission to Mission, so you can check out the additional resources that they have there as well as um, Kelly's contact information if you do want to follow up for um, kind of like a one-on-one -on -one consultation or, you know, checking out. Um, they have, eventually we'll get back to doing retreats and things, right, Kelly? <laughs> and there are some scheduled for. Yeah, it's hard to um, So there are <laughs> opportunities, you know, that information's there too. Um, yep. So look out for that. Um, and once again, there is going to be a very short uh, survey when you log off of this. So. Um, Thank you very much to all of you. And thanks again, Kelly. Um, and we hope to be able to connect with you again soon. Be well, everyone. Take care, everybody.